government of Uganda has positioned innovation as one of the key drivers of socioeconomic transformation. And we have laid down Vision 2040. When you study that vision, it anchors science, technology, and innovation as a key driver which is going to result in the changes in the different sectors in the country. Higher education and innovation are very closely interwoven. Very, very closely interwoven. And uh, it is during this stage of education that skills are consolidated that knowledge is consolidated, that science, technology, and innovation is properly understood and channeled into uh, developing the economy. So uh, it's very, very important that we work very, very closely because the knowledge base which is provided in education serves as the foundation for the skills that enable science, technology, and innovation to prosper, to grow, and support the economic development. On the other hand, innovation promotes a culture of creativity, uh, problem solving, and continuous learning, which are essential for skill development and societal advancement. Our Vision 2040 uh, also singles out, among others, human capital development. Human capital development. And of course, there is no bigger player of human capital development than the education sector in the country. The East Africa Community Vision 2050 also emphasizes promotion of learning opportunities and skills through science, technology, and innovation as an avenue to development. This therefore mandates the education sector to ensure implementation of skilling in order to achieve development. I do not fall. I'm excited as we meet here and I think this is the first conference that I'm privileged to be part of. I have been just informally talking to the director and saying, why do you do these conferences when we are not there? We are key players. And we would like you to address certain things. Because literally science, technology and innovation lies idle. It lies idle in our nation as a sleeping giant. If we can only connect, then we will be able to address easily the issues of uh, employability and innovation very, very easily. Uh, some of the issues that have been hinted on, I will not go so much into them in this address, but some of them I will address in the keynote. However, one issue I wish to talk about, to mention here, is the structures of the universities, which make it very difficult for us to be continuously evolving. Whereas universities are autonomous in their culture under the guidance of the National Council, we seem to have built brick walls around those systems, such that we are not as, um, how do I call it, we are not as flexible. We are not moving with the speed of knowledge generation. We are not moving, our curriculum is not evolving as fast as knowledge generation is happening, as fast as technology 
is happening. Because we set up these structures and we encase ourselves with them. When I was in West Africa, I was quite impressed. After the first year, Ebola was introduced into the curriculum from basic education level to higher education level, just like that. The first exams they did after opening their schools had Ebola. But here we have very, we have set up very complicated uh, systems which sustain the ivory tower concept. The ivory tower mindset where there's so much knowledge into the university, a lot of it, it just doesn't have holes to leak into the community surroundings. I hope this is one of the issues because the employers are changing their needs daily. They cannot wait for you to implement a particular curriculum for five years, then they evaluate. By then, they are on the fourth or fifth level of technology. So by the time you try to, the people you're bringing out, they don't have the knowledge and skills. So we should be producing at this point, by the time somebody is entering the university, we are even forecasting what's going to happen. And we are including that. And the technical team delivery should be modifying content. I hope we no longer have the concept of yellow notes. <laughs> I Ghana people may not understand the concept of yellow notes. Yellow notes arose from when lecturers used textbooks, and you are in 1980, but the textbook is 1965, 1970. So there is really no need to update the notes. So year after year, the lecturer writes the notes once, and year after year, they just speak, and with exposure to the environment, the paper turns yellow. <laughs> but now, that we are computerized, I hope that we are quickly updating what we are teaching. So one of the issues on how do we address employability is exactly in the second part of the thing, innovation. We must be innovative day after day. Ideally, you should not teach two classes, subsequent classes, the same content. Because so much new material has come up, and if those people are going to fit in employment, then they must be having that new uh, information. So it's very, very important that we should also be continuously engaging employers. Here I found that uh, in a small nation called Mauritius, their university staff, taking the teaching staff, must spend time with industry. They have a prescribed time. They must spend time with industry or their teaching license is not renewed. That helps the university and higher education instructors to be in touch with what the employers need. But as long as academia is separate from industry, or we just go there as visitors, we don't really understand it is going to be difficult for us to tune skills, to tune attitudes, to tune at these people. I have titled the presentation based on the theme Fostering Graduate Employability and Innovations. I wish to begin by saying that education is not complete until the individual has a gainful livelihood. 
we cannot simply give dump on somebody so much knowledge and then at the end they drop off like a cliff. Education must nurture this person until they have a gainful livelihood. And let that guide us as we think. If we think through education just as um, convention, nursery, kindergarten, graduation, we are done with you. That is not going to foster employability. What is employability? I took some time to look through uh, what employability is. Employability refers to those skills, knowledge, abilities and attributes that make an individual desirable to employers, assuming the employers are there. So, it refers to the technical package of skills um, that a particular a certain job or industry requires. It refers to the soft skills such as ability to communicate, teamwork, problem solving, uh, adaptability, emotional intelligence, ability to thrive and progress within the workplace. These are skills that make people choose. Uh, personally, I learned this a little early. I learned it I went through a lot in the beginning. I was very, very, very bright, very smart. But when I had to begin work, I discovered that there was so much I didn't know. There were so many skills that I didn't have. Uh, so those sort of skills, negotiation, uh, being able to communicate effectively, and then it also arises out of a combination of formal education and practical experience. Both formal education, practical experience, and also personality attributes. I think something's got to fair. So, attributes that come. So, you'll find that um, recently I had a conversation and uh, I we are discussing and they said, you know, if you want specific jobs to be done, look for people who have a job. Don't look for people who are unemployed. Because people who have employability, even in this task of jobs, they are employed. The people who are, are out there, they lack something. The employability. Of course, it is the process of introducing something new or significantly um, improving upon what is existing. I think let me come. So, economic value. So, if you have uh, your capital, the capital can be calculated at an individual level. Some people say they are taking our people. They have people, I've seen companies say they are stealing our staff. But we have a lot of people who are not employed. Why? Because some people have a high capital value, while others have a low capital value. But also as a nation, we are looking at if we put together our scales and all this human capital, they usually publish something called the Human Capital Index. What are the critical needs of any nation? The critical need of any nation is to protect our people and their resources. That is usually the first and most important. You must be able to protect your people and their resources which will be the best to build in their value. So, security and safety is very, very critical. The second need is for us to expand opportunities for livelihood. 
and development for a growing population. Population is growing both in numbers, but both in but also in ambition, in expectation, in life, socioeconomically, they are growing. Is the nation able to expand and go beyond? If you just grow just a little bit just to accommodate inflation, loss of value, inflation is loss of value, then your, name, your people feel stagnated. But if you don't even do that, then you begin to retrogress. People begin to feel unhappy and poor and redundant. We also need to be able to continuously be addressing challenges of poverty and underdevelopment. Now, all these things can be achieved if people have employment opportunities. Both the process of creating employment opportunities, the process of making those opportunities deliver what you want to get out of them, then the nation will start to feel a sense of progress and to have the people move together. So how do we do that? How do you do that? Every nation, the developed and the underdeveloped, we all have three resources. We've turned these resources National Development Triad. I'm an epidemiologist, and epidemiologists like the triads. <laughs> we always deal with things in threes. It seems to, we hear it's a very stable figure. It's very stable when you sit on the three. So each nation has natural resources. They may differ which one, how much, but every nation, which we can call a nation, has natural resources. Then we all have time. Time is the most equitably distributed, non-renewable resource. Just because every day you have a day and a night does not mean that time is renewable. Time is non-renewable. And time doesn't actually care. It just passes you by. But this is very equitably distributed. Developed and underdeveloped nations, we have the same. And it's a very big resource. Then we have the human capital. We have the human capital. And the humans are the ones who have the capacity to think, generate ideas, which unleash the wealth from the other two, from the natural resources and from time. That is why when we are measuring how nations are, we measure using something called GDP. How much wealth have you generated from the resources that you have? If it is per individual, how much wealth does each person generate annually? How much more have you been able to produce? And so GDP per capita measured in those units of those resources. Per is usually year, capita is human being. How much wealth have you created from the natural resources you have? Because natural resources are potential. There has been a very nice picture circulating on social media. Africa waiting for investors. They are seated in poverty, in huts, on top of minerals. Because we are waiting for investors. So, research, science and technology is the process which enables human beings to generate, when they generate their ideas, I talked about everything comes from an idea. So science and technology and innovation helps human beings 
to come up with new ideas, and those new ideas are processed through a system and converted into new wealth. The one who has a certificate is still going to be The one who did a diploma is still going to be Even those who did degrees, they are also doing it there. But when we started to innovate in that sector and start to make vehicles, now we have expanded. Within just a short time, we have created currently, we have 150 jobs that we have created. And when we open our factory, which we hope to happen in the second half of this year, we are going to quickly create 600 very high quality jobs. Now, for each of those, those are the primary ones. Then we hope to create 30,000 secondary jobs. Those are jobs which are being done by those entities that supply Chira Motors, just Chira Motors. So that way you create a lot of uh, opportunities. And then the people who come from the education system have where to go. Also, innovation in the education itself, in the education system itself, it is required. We cannot continue teaching the way we taught. We cannot continue teaching what we have been teaching. Education itself requires innovation. The way we are delivering, uh, we need to bring in a new content, we need to bring in the modern content, and that is the only way that we can enable people to be employable. To be employable, there must be an employment opportunity. What is it? We tend to think that uh, if I've been trained in welding, I have skills. You have been trained in auto repair, I have skills. True, you have skills. But what is missing in most of our graduates is how do you take ideas to the market? Because right now we are operating in the 10% capacity of our sector. And if we just rotate there, skilling people there, skilling people there, and we are not enabling people to get out of there and go into value addition, we are 90% of the value is. Then, even if those graduates have those skills and they master, they can master how to grow coffee because I've had a skill in agriculture. But I'm not going to better other people or myself beyond a certain point. So the repertoire of skills, the skills in what I call a black box, we must open up that area, understand which knowledge is in that black box, which skills are in that black box, and then when we equip the graduates of our education system with those skills, we are just going to fly. It's a good start, it's a good beginning for us to begin looking at ed education differently from what we had deteriorated into. We had really deteriorated into exams and results, and those exams don't link at all with life. You know, a child gets A, but they, they don't have any, they cannot use that knowledge for anything. They are just an academic giant. And they might even qualify into some profession, but they don't have the skill to make that profession work for them. So I might be a first class engineer, but then when I get out of there, what do I do? They do the jobs they find, they think they are beneath them, but also that is very different from you actually being able to think and be creative and open up new areas in engineering. So the new curriculum is a good beginning for us to think, for us to build people who can think. And if we can build on that in the higher education, uh, the higher education, if we can build on that in the new curriculum, of course, the first group is going to sit this year. There is still a lot to learn, a lot of learning to do. When we have refined it and it is effective, I think it is going to be a good beginning. We definitely need to keep aligning the content with the, the future, where opportunities are. Doctor, you have to call Uganda. 